scientist. I am Nitmi Dayaratna. I am Hirudini Fernanda. I am Tarka Chandrasiri. Uh, we are chemistry special undergraduates at the University of Colombo and we'll be conducting today's interview. Science has potential to revolutionize a man's life and science has potential to solve humankind's problems. Across the broad expanse of history, there have been a handful of smart people who had that potential. We are interviewing some of these brilliant minds for our ongoing series of interviews conducted by the Department of Chemistry, University of Colombo. I would like to warmly welcome Dr. Peter Fishman. Hi, introduce, hi, doctor. To introduce Dr. Fishman, he is the CEO and co-founder of Sapien Technologies. He worked as a JCESR project scientist and as a JCESR postdoctoral scientist at Berkeley Labs. He was an Alexander von Humboldt postdoctoral fellow at University in Wurzburg. Dr. Frischmann obtained his PhD in inorganic and supramolecular chemistry from the University of British Columbia. Also, he completed his PSc chemistry degree at Idaho State University. Good evening, Dr. Frischmann. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining with us today. It's my pleasure. To start with, could you please give us a brief description of yourself and a bit of background about your work? For sure. So I am, as you stated, a, a trained PhD chemist who has made a substantial shift in my career trajectory, uh, starting a company, Set Beyond Technologies, now five years ago, and really working to bring new technologies to market that mitigate science or mitigate climate change with science-based solutions. So uh, I've always been passionate about renewable energy, even from actually quite a young age. My father took me to a solar-powered car race when I was maybe seven or eight, and the cars moved very slowly, maybe, maybe 80 kilometers per hour, but it was it was just amazing how quiet it was seeing this race of these really, these electric cars at all different designs uh, driving around this racetrack. And it just captivated me and got me interested in generally in solar energy and renewable energy. And uh, slowly I moved into engineering and science through my education and got into chemistry and really found my niche there, uh, finding just the, the, how exciting it is that chemistry explains the fundamentals of how the world works. Dr. Peter, what influenced or inspired you to pursue a career in science? Well, uh, you know, partially those influences that I mentioned before, I had a grandfather as well, who was a metallurgist for General Electric. And he was a lifetime engineer there. He worked on developing ultra strong, lightweight alloys for jet turbine engines. And I remember actually at one point visiting him in, in New York, in Schenectady, where the General Electric main research facility was at the time. And he took me to his labs and he gave me, you know, he was giving me this full tour and it was just wild seeing this metallurgy happening. I was probably 10 years old or something. And he gave me a rod of a few different metals and it was iron, maybe copper. And then he gave me a rod of tungsten, which is incredibly dense compared to almost anything. And it just blew my mind that this one thing that was the same shape as everything else could be so much heavier than everything else that I had just held. Uh, that, that was a really interesting just experience, like eye opening about the world around me. Uh, my grandfather in particular was always you know, like asking questions, wanting to understand the world uh, and encouraging me to, to do the same and, and explore natural phenomena. I, I don't feel like I ever 
you know, was certain as I was going into high school or even necessarily in university initially certain that science was what I wanted to study and learn. It almost like caught up to me. So as a freshman, so my first year in undergraduate at Idaho State University, I was in a chemistry class that was a prerequisite. I actually was a, a mechanical engineering major to begin with. And one point um, my chemistry class, we would be assigned certain questions out of the textbook to do certain homework problems. And some of them would have answers in the back of the book. And those questions were usually not assigned as homework because the answers were there. So I caught myself in my dorm room doing all of the unassigned homework problems that had answers in the back so that I was sure that I was doing the assigned homework problems correctly. And then that might sound normal for some people, but that is definitely not me doing extra homework so that I make sure I'm doing my homework right. And it just hit me like, do I like this? Like, what is going on? I'm doing extra homework. I could be out doing anything else, but I'm sitting here doing chemistry homework that I don't have to do. <clears throat> like, it, it was a weird experience for me. Uh, so part of, part of that draw was I had a really great teacher in my, in my first chemistry class is Dr. Rene Rodriguez. And he, he was just very kind and thoughtful and he would spend extra time to, to explain concepts and, and really encourage me actually to come in and do some undergraduate research in his lab. So I, I followed up with him about that. Then I had an opportunity to do some chemical vapor deposition of, of some solar cell materials in his laboratory as an undergraduate. And I'd say from then on, I was pretty hooked. Like it was really cool. The idea of making completely new materials that the world has never seen before that could be used to, to solve big problems like climate change by, by th doing things like harvesting energy from the sun. <clears throat> so th that, at that point, I think my path was pretty set, uh, at least through undergrad and then PhD was, uh, it, it was a different experience just because I used my education, and this is a beautiful thing about science. Science is a universal language. Uh, and it, it's really a great way, by studying science, by studying chemistry, it's a great way to travel around the world and engage with all different types of people and, and learn. Uh, you're, you have a mutual bond through just being interested and curious in how the world works. And the beautiful thing about science and nature is it works the same in Sri Lanka as it works here in California. Uh, and so you can speak the same language anywhere when you're speaking through science. And so I've used science throughout my career as a way to travel the world and have new experiences, having studied in Germany, uh, Canada, and now I'm in the United States. But that, that, that really drew me to it as well. Like just being curious, but then also the, the, the way it's a key that unlocks global travel and other cultures. Like we're having a conversation right now. Happy Dr. Fishman. Uh, my next question is, uh, we know you are the CEO and the co-founder of Sapient Technologies. So can you tell us what prompted you to build your company and how you started Sapient Technologies? I can. Uh, a number of factors, but I would say I'll highlight two. One, uh, so actually I originally got into my PhD and as I was leaving my PhD thinking I was going to be a professor, so I wanted to be a faculty member. And I did, I did two postdocs and I applied for faculty positions twice uh, to probably 30 different schools. It's very competitive. Uh, I was probably a 90th percentile candidate and you needed to be a 98th and have a good recommendation from someone that knew people. Uh, so. That was a frustrating experience, going down a path that I thought I wanted and being and failing, frankly, uh, which is OK. That's how you learn and that's how you find new things. Uh, and in doing that, I had an opportunity while I was at Berkeley Lab while working with uh, Brett Helms, working for in his group to do something called the i -Corps program, which is kind of like a boot camp for potential entrepreneurs. It encourages a group that has an interesting new research development to go out and interview people in industry uh, that might be users of the technology that you're trying to develop in the lab. 
And so at the time I was working on membranes for batteries, for lithium sulfur batteries in particular, and had a chance to go and talk to, it was about 60, 65 different people in the world of energy storage and batteries and figure out you know, what it was that they really needed in terms of new technology and what they thought was going to be really important for the market. And I was really surprised at the incongruent nature of what I thought was important and how I was writing my papers at the time with what people in the industry said was important. And I think a lot of it was just the timelines that academia often operates on relative to industry, where industry is thinking, you know, two years ahead, maybe five years ahead, but that's that's pretty far ahead often for what they're willing to invest in from an R and D perspective, at least most companies, some are, some are have a, a longer research track, long, longer research program that they'll develop in, but many are very short sighted in a way because they have to be, they have to move a product to market. They have to sell the next generation of the product. And so it's much more of an iterative R and D versus a, a breakthrough R and D process, which is more of the academic style, which is thinking about how do we really push, the boundaries of human knowledge and understand like what's at the edge. Like I want to walk over the edge and peer over and try and figure out what's there uh, so that we can go just a little bit further each time. And that to me is more of fundamental science, more of academic side of things. And to be blunt, uh, it takes 20 years often uh, pretty regularly for something that is at the frontier of scientific knowledge. So often being discovered and developed in an academic lab to ever turn into a commercial product that really gets into consumers' hands or gets into the market in any way. So, so there was just a misalignment in my desire to have an impact on climate change with science-based solutions. And the career trajectory that I was pursuing in academia, uh, where you know, there's a really long time to bring those new developments to market. And, and that's not to say that you can't do this faster. And there certainly are faculty members who have been successful in discovering something and seeing it to fruition in the market on a shorter timeline. But historically, it's a very long, slow, arduous process to discover something new in physical sciences and turn it into a, a commercial product that has a big impact. So those things kind of just, those concepts all came together very at a very similar time for me. And I saw, you know, there was this opportunity to continue pursuing an academic path, which would involve writing more papers and publishing, you know, always trying to publish in science and nature. Uh, but then, you know, what's, to me, I had to question, you know, what's the reward system here? After I publish in science and nature, you know, I cheer, I, I go, I go give a bunch of lectures for a year and then, then you have to do it again. And that's pretty cyclical at that point. Like that's the top of the world for the most part. Uh, and so, and I just thought that there was more of an opportunity for me to have an impact with my science by starting a company that was trying to commercialize new chemistry, new technology to develop better batteries that could make electric vehicles drive further, that could store renewable energy for longer on the grid and make it more realistic to have 100% clean power. All right, Doctor, uh, if I'm right, you have joined Cyclotron Road Cohort 2. So how did Cyclotron Road support you as an entrepreneurial scientist? In so many ways. It's an incredible organization filled with incredible people. Uh, they have a, a, a mantra that's, uh, that they support people, not projects, and they very much stand by that. Uh, the, the organization now is five years old, maybe six years old. Uh, they've actually expanded also now to Boston. They're called Activate as a larger organization. And it's really, uh, I think it's gonna be one of the more impactful organizations that started in the last 10, 20 years when we look back in 20 years. Uh, what they're doing is they're, they're supporting scientists to really go through a crash course in entrepreneurial training and in searching rapidly, rapid prototyping for product market fit with their technology in a very safe program. So there's, they have two years in that program where you're supported financially and you have the chance just to mix and mingle with 
all different types of influencers and decision makers and technologists and investors and, and corporate thought leaders uh, so so regularly. It's, it's incredible the network that they have and the way that they're able to uh, bring eager innovators like myself into this space where we are, we're free to learn and explore. And uh, for me, it was very influential because to be, to be honest, I knew absolutely nothing about business. <laughs> When I started this company, I was completely naive uh, what it would take to be successful. And I probably still am quite naive, honestly, even after having done it for five years. Uh, it's just such a different skill set. You know, doing research is, uh, we spend a lot of time honing those skills. And many of the skills are useful and can be translated to helping build a business. But many of them are completely orthogonal. And so, you know, I've had to learn a lot of new skills and i had a chance through cyclotron road to work with people that that helped educate me faster and challenged me to be you know, the best entrepreneur that i possibly could be so i'm, I'm forever grateful and indebted to that organization and, and excited that they're they're growing as you mentioned and your recent focus has been on developing composite membranes for ion selective transport can you briefly explain about these highly tunable membranes and what are the devices of current interest in your research work? Mm -hmm. So the original work uh, that Sepion was founded on was some, some work applying a class of polymer materials known as polymers of intrinsic microporosity. Uh, these polymers are quite unique uh, in terms of their physical properties and their general backbone structure compared to the majority of polymers in two ways. Uh, one way is that the backbone of the polymer has no rotatable bonds, so it's very rigid. And the monomers have intentionally engineered molecular kinks or bends in the backbone. So you have this polymer as it grows, you have all these strange contortions in the backbone of the polymer and it can't really flex or wiggle. So you can take these polymers and you can cast thin films of them like a typical polymer. But a typical polymer, as you cast a thin film of it, the carrier solvent will evaporate and the polymer chains wiggle and densify and you end up with a very tightly packed non-porous film. Now with these polymers of intrinsic microporosity though, the difference is that when the carrier solvent is evaporating, the polymers can't really wiggle as much and they can't pack in such a dense state. So what's left behind is a porous network of very tight pore size distribution pores, typically in the half nanometer to two nanometer range. So you have this thin film that can be processed conventionally like a polymer, but you have this advantage of being able to engineer very precise, very small pores into the backbone uh, that traditionally you could only get from inorganic materials like zeolites or moths, perhaps. But those materials cannot be processed as easily as these types of materials. So these polymers can act as an atomic sieve. So those pores are so small that if you account for the hydration shell uh, of a given ion, that they can actually discriminate between monovalent and divalent ions uh, and that gives rise to pretty incredible selectivity inside of uh, whatever device that they're being tested in. Uh, traditionally, these materials were used for gas separations. And it was with Brett Helms and his group where we first thought, well, if you can separate gases with these materials, why couldn't you put them in an electrolyte and separate ions? And that was really where the concept of Sepion was born was taking a class of materials that have been developed and explored for one application space. And then you know, the brilliance of, of my co-founder, Brett, in recognizing that this concept should be applicable to you know, a very different medium, a battery electrolyte. And in fact, it is. So we started to fine tune the chemistry of these polymers so that they would be, uh, they would be able to wet inside of conventional electrolytes for things like lithium sulfur, or lithium metal batteries, or with mine batteries and started to test the size discrimination properties of these materials. And, and it's quite exciting how diverse 
a set of you know diverse set of battery chemistries can take advantage from these types of polymer membranes. And so that was the inception kind of of, of Sepion's technology. And now we've been working for five years, developing off of that concept, heading in in other in multiple directions really, and how the material is composed. Uh, but that was sort of the core original concept that really encouraged us to pursue starting a business that we did see such impressive ion selectivity for a wide variety of battery chemistries with these membranes. Okay, Dr. Fishman, uh, what would be the real life applications based on your research work and how this would influence the society? Yeah, so, so at Sepion, we are commercializing lithium metal batteries that are enabled with new ion selective membranes. And so a lithium metal battery uh, is really in similar in concept to a lithium ion battery. So what already is powering electric vehicles, powering our grid, powering our phones and laptops right now. Uh, but well, the key difference is that in a lithium ion battery, the anode is made out of graphite and it's actually quite inefficient at storing energy. So graphite's really the legacy material of lithium ion batteries so where Sony this big breakthrough back in the late 80s, early 90s that led to the commercialization of a lithium ion battery was deciding to use graphite as a host for electrons and lithium ions. And still you know, 30, 30 years later, we're still using graphite as our principal anode material in our most energy dense batteries. But for every one lithium ion that's actually storing energy in a lithium ion battery in graphite, there's six carbon atoms that are really doing nothing but just snuggling that lithium and making sure it's comfortable and safe. And so uh, if you can get rid of all that carbon and just put pure lithium in the anode, you can increase the capacity of the anode by about tenfold. And that translates to an energy density gain of about 40% 40, 40 practically speaking for the entire device. So what can you do if your battery weighs 40% less and maybe takes up 40% less volume. Well, there's a few different things. Uh, one of the most impactful ones that's really what we're pursuing as a business is to support and help accelerate the commercialization of electric vehicles for transportation. And so if you have, uh, if you can put more battery, more energy in a smaller space, then you can pack more battery in. So an electric vehicle could in theory drive further or alternatively, you could actually design the vehicle differently. You could make it smaller because you have a smaller battery pack. Uh, you could also potentially drop the cost of the vehicle substantially as well. You have less inactive material. You could have less uh, of the full packs inside of the battery and still have a similar range because of the weight reduction, volume reduction of the battery. So, so the big things that we're after is you know, driving conversion of transportation away from fossil fuel consumption and into you know fully electrified future and by improving the performance of the fundamental battery uh, that is going into every vehicle today i really see an opportunity for us to make a really big impact while simultaneously you know, creating a lot of of uh, revenue and wealth for a company for myself for my colleagues and our investors Dr. Peter, since you have already explained the importance and the real life application of your research work, I must ask uh, how you are planning to improve this further and what would be the future of composite membranes? Uh, good question. There's a lot of different directions and actually <laughs> the hard thing for me is, is saying no is I want to try everything. There's so many interesting, exciting new materials to try, interesting directions to take the science. Um, this is a struggle, I would say, actually, in going from an academic setting to an industrial setting where, you know, the, re the reward in academia or what you're really after is discovering something new and then being able to share it with the world. Um, and you don't have to do more than that. You just have to, you know, publish it, build on that, share it. 
But in industry, you know, we could discover something really cool, but if we can't sell it, we go out of business. So I, this has probably been a shortcoming of mine early on as the leader of Sepion in not being more strict in deciding when to kill a project, like when to recognize that something that we're working on is only a science project and is never going to be a real product. Uh, it's difficult to be disciplined when you are faced with the harsh realities of economics when you are also trying to do really great science. Uh, so, you know, from the membrane perspective, we have uh, a nice suite of really interesting composites right now that are helping improve the smooth plating of lithium so that electric vehicles can charge faster and safely. And one of the key things that we are doing now is really building out the full cell around the membrane. So a typical, you know, when someone's developing a new battery uh, or any sort of energy storage chemistry, they often first look at the electrodes where the energy is stored. So the anode and the cathode, and they optimize those. And then frequently the next thing would be the electrolyte. And then finally, in lithium ion batteries at least, it's just called the separator, which is just a polyolefin, a porous polyolefin layer that prevents electrical shorting of the two electrodes, but allows for the transport of ionic current between the electrodes during charging and discharging. So we're really completely flipping that design theory on its head, and we are focusing on the membrane first. So we go to the very center of the, of the battery, and we say, hey, if we have this great membrane that can enable smooth lithium electroplating, then we're gonna bring the electrodes into place, and we're gonna work on optimizing the electrolyte a co-optimization with our membrane because we know that they are, you know, the membrane can interact with the electrolyte and can change the fundamentals of the ion transport within the membrane. So the next kind of big steps for us as a business are taking the suite of membranes that we've been developing now for five years and really focusing on putting all the other pieces in place around them to demonstrate the full cell improvement so the, a battery that can deliver 40% more energy in the same amount of space uh, and, and have it lighter as well so that we can deliver those, those minimum viable products, those cells to our customers, which are electric vehicle manufacturers, so they can test them and validate the performance results and come back to us and be really excited that you know, we need to work with Sepion. We want this battery technology in our next generation of electric vehicles because consumers are going to love these and we're going to sell a lot of cars. We have these batteries in them. So uh, our next big push is really about optimizing the full device. Uh, now that we have this great component that we've developed for the centerpiece of the battery. Interesting. So we know that you are doing research and at the same time you lead the company. So this must be very challenging. So what is the most challenging part of this all and how do you deal with those challenges? Uh, it is, it's actually impossible <laughs> pretty much to do both well. Uh, I think for me, actually, the hardest thing has been recognizing when you are no longer capable of doing both at a high level. And uh, I, I failed to recognize that as early as I should have, to be honest. Uh, in the early days of Sepion, you know, when you're really scrappy and we have almost no money and very few employees and the company is, you know, a concept and some of you know, research that I did during my postdoc and, and some early research in the company, uh, you have to, as the leader of the company, you have to be moving the science and the technology forward, but you also have to be building a business, uh, establishing connections, uh, talking to customers, really understanding the market so that I can ensure that the way I am allocating those, minimal resources I have to actually developing the technology uh, that we're going after the most important questions. And so early on, I would say I, I didn't realize that I didn't have the time to do both of these well at the same time. And uh, I think I default, I focused on building the company and the business because, you know, if you don't have money to operate, you can't build any products. Uh, so fortunately, 
had a chance to sort of reorient and bring some great people into the team. And, and one of the big challenges for me then professionally was finding ways to, you know, let go of some of the research and development and to trust the people that I've hired to really take on that leadership of the technology development while I'm you know, committed a lot of my time to talking to customers, to talking to investors, to analyzing our pathways to market and to making, again, making sure that the resources, resources we're committing to the product development are going to get us to a product that our customers care about. Uh, and, and surprisingly, that's actually one of the main ways that startups fail. Uh, it's not that they don't build a product that does something interesting. It's that, you know, from the time they first talked to a customer and then they went and raised some money, they put their heads down and they started working hard to develop that product. Two years later, they come out of their laboratory with the product that their customer said that they wanted. And two years has gone by and the customer no longer cares about the problem that they spoke to that person about two years ago. And so this is especially true you know, in, in electric vehicles, in renewable energy right now. I mean, the industry is changing so fast and moving so fast, you know, that what big picture, what, what, what is wanted by customers hasn't changed that much, but the more nuances that you know, a product that a small company can develop can really impact evolve quite quickly. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's on me to make sure that we have these close ties to big industry players and understand what their needs are so that we're constantly updating our technology roadmaps, updating our testing plans to make sure that it's really aligned with what industry cares about. Uh, so, so that's been, I'd say, some of the, the bigger challenges. Uh, it's also been one of the bigger joys, to be honest, just pushing myself to learn new things and to develop new skills. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time doing research in a lab and I love it. I love, I honestly even like running columns as long as your com as long as your compounds are colored. <laughs> I was just getting in there and doing, doing the chemistry and making new molecules and getting a great clean NMR spectrum. Like it's, it's exciting. Uh, but, but it also was time for me to just challenge myself to learn some new things. And so you know, starting a business and managing people and managing finances and talking to customers is, been quite the crash course and it's been the most difficult, but also the most rewarding in five years of my career so far. All right, Dr. Fishman, uh, what are your opinions on the role of a chemist in the future of science? Interesting. Uh, well, one, we're always going to need chemists. So the world is made out of materials and uh, even even biological materials, we, we need to understand how those work fundamentally and progress will be made by discovering new materials or, or finding better ways to put existing materials together into uh, things that have unique properties. So that in that sense, the role of chemists shouldn't change too much. However, I think the workflow is going to change substantially. Uh, I think there's going to be a much greater push, and I think we're already seeing this for kind of hybridization of skill sets within chemistry. Like if you know synthetic chemistry, you also need to know a lot of biology. And if you know inorganic chemistry, you also need to know, say, a lot of physics, uh, just kind of how you find the, the maximum impact for the skill set that you've been developing uh, by, by crossing over fields. Uh, I think is the the way you're going to see chemists really making an impact. And that's already, that's been happening for some time. Uh, the other thing I think is going to change and we're seeing more and more of is as computational power becomes cheaper and cheaper, uh, we're going to see theory introduced and be much more influential in helping understand chemical outcomes and predict targets that should be uh, prioritized in developing uh, new new products, new technologies. Uh, same with data-driven approaches. So more statistical methods, uh, really seeing the power of computation as an aid to 
chemists in how they solve problems and how they set up experiments to be as efficient as possible with their time in the lab to get to answers for their hypotheses. And this is something that I've actually been quite resistant to. Uh, and I'm only now starting to really come around. And I think I felt that you know, data-driven approaches and computational methods were possibly going to like replace chemists. Like we wouldn't need chemists anymore. And uh, that was foolish. It was a knee-jerk reaction. And, and what I really see now is they're very complementary. And so uh, I think it's exciting seeing you know, how a data-driven approach with a, with a big experimental set can help a analyze and pull out trends that maybe we wouldn't be able to see with our own eyes. Uh, but to begin with, you know, the chemist and their chemical intuition had to be there to set the experiments in the right course. And then you rely on the computations and, and the theory to, and the models to then help you identify the trends from the data that you collected. So I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Thank you. Uh, Doctor, I have a different question for you. Life uh, outside work plays a massive role in the success of one's profession. So how do you spend your time outside your work? Yeah, I've, I've lived by the statement, work hard, play hard, for my entire, let's say from undergraduate onward. And in fact, I picked University of British Columbia, when I applied for graduate schools, I picked all places that were near mountains because I love to backpack and ski and go mountaineering. So uh, it's always really important for me, especially to get out into nature. Uh, that's really where I feel you know, like true freedom. It's when you're off the grid and you're out in nature and it's just you and some good friends and, and beautiful scenery and you got to rely on your smarts and uh, and just soak up what's around you. Uh, really appreciate the world around you. Uh, that's one of the key things I do. I will say, though, also, I now have a two-year-old son. So at this point, most of the play hard involves uh, hopping around playgrounds and uh, going down slides and building with Legos. Interesting. So uh, Doctor, I have a interesting question for you. If you travel back in time, what advice would you give to your younger self? I like this question and I must say, I feel like I could reflect on it for a really long time and I'd probably keep coming up with different answers. But on the fly tonight, I would go with, I was very fixated on having a career in academia you know, once I decided I was in chemistry, like I decided I wanted to be a faculty member and I'm not really sure why. I think it might've just been, I didn't have many other influences around me aside from other professors uh, and they were great people. Uh, but only after you know, doing a five-year PhD, doing a three-year postdoc, and then starting to do a second postdoc for two years, did I really learn by looking at the data, at least in the, in the United States, that only one in 10 people with a PhD in chemistry ever get a job in academia. So there's, very, there's actually very little opportunity to go out and be a professor. Uh, I wish I had spent more time during my education, uh, my formal education, just exploring you know, what other career opportunities there are since statistically there's a 90% chance you're going to get a, some other job. <laughs> uh, and I, you know, I guess I found that out the hard way by failing, but you know, that's ultimately led to where I am now, which I'm very pleased with. Uh, I don't regret the path that I've taken, but I do wish I had spent a little more time just thinking about other paths, what other possibilities that there are. Uh, and the other one that I think is really valuable that I'd like to share with, with you all is no matter how good your relationship is with your advisor, your boss, you know, someone that you think has your best interest in mind, ultimately you need to be your own biggest advocate and you really need to take control of your own career steps. Um, go out there. If there's something that you want, you're going to be the one that makes it happen. Uh, so I think it's easy 
uh, when you're in an academic setting to just feel like your advisor, you know, they're looking out for you and they, and they are, but they also probably have six other PhD students and their own career that they're looking out for. Uh, and you, know, you can, you can calculate where you might be on the priority list. So make sure you know, you're your own first priority, go out and make things happen for yourself. Okay, Dr. Frischman, um, I'd like to know, uh, do you have a role model or any other scientist or any particular person who inspires to do your work and makes you keep going? There's probably of, of the scientists that I have learned about and enjoyed and admired, the one that comes to mind is Alexander von Humboldt. Uh, he was just a full-on explorer scientist. Like he traveled all over the world, climbed up volcanoes in South America, uh, learned about how different habitats are at different elevations, uh, and really you know, brought a lot of, I guess you could call it innovation, to biology at the time uh, with his contemporaries. And then at the same time was you know, interested in human rights and, and really just an incredible polymath who was ultimately curious about everything. I think maybe that's also the other thing I really like about him. Besides being an explorer and a scientist, uh, just infinitely curious. Uh, I think that's a good way to go through life and be happy. Doctor, how do you think science can be made more appealing to the general public? where an average person can see its impact on their life. Ooh, this is, this could be the topic of a whole just hour conversation. Uh, so good, good question. <clears throat> I am frequently frustrated by the fact that the general public doesn't often appreciate uh, what science is doing for them. Uh, I particularly get upset when I see people posting on the internet uh, that they don't trust science or scientists and i'm like really how do you think your phone worked and the internet that you just posted this message to you obviously trust science for 99 percent of the things in your life but not this one uh, and so that's just me ranting for a moment but <clears throat> i think the way that we might go about solving this is pretty systematic and deep within society. Uh, one is you know, really committing to STEM education. And so making sure that uh, we're heavily invested as a society in, in educating everyone in science and, and mathematics. And we could get at art there as well. STEAM, I like the STEM to STEAM transition, uh, but, but really pushing for a basic level of science literacy uh, amongst society. And then I think, you know, maybe more proactively for all of us as scientists is to really focus on fine tuning and building our communication skills and not just how we communicate with one another, uh, but recognizing that you know, for many people, most people, the language of science is like speaking a foreign language. Like it's, no, most of the words that we would say mean nothing to uh, someone that is not trained in chemistry. And so, you know, finding ways to communicate difficult concepts using standard language and using analogy, I think is a skill that we can all work on that will help us relate the, the important concepts of science and its impact on everyone's lives uh, to people that maybe generally don't show an interest or aptitude for for science and so you know, that's something i strive for and really have worked on as i've moved into entrepreneurship because i do often interact with people non-scientists and need to convince them that the things that we're doing are really effective and important uh, so I, I think that would be my my key piece of advice that we can all act on is to, continuously improving how we communicate science to, to non-experts. Doctor, what areas of chemistry do you think would be leading in the future? And why do you think so? Well, I must say, 
with what I'm very kind of tunnel vision on energy storage these days. Uh, you know, I told you I, I only have so much time now to really do research uh, and read up on the current literature. But if I had to take a pass at an area that I think is really important, and also there's a lot of exciting technology and, and new materials to be discovered, would be focusing on the circular economy and starting to design products and materials with recycling in mind from the beginning. So how do you make materials that can go out, do a full life cycle, duty cycle in the real world, 10, 20 years, and are going to be able to come back to the, the municipalities or to the original manufacturer and be deconstructed into their principal components and then be reused in a way where the original material qualities are as good or even like potentially better, like upcycled in some way. Uh, this is an area that I, there is a lot of motion happening now. I think the governments of the world are starting to get behind, especially pl in the plastics industry, uh, trying to address plastic pollution. And you know, part of that is going to be new materials coupled to smart policy and really rethinking how we as a society define the economics of, of trash. Like what, why is it essentially always cheaper to just throw it somewhere uh, when in reality, you know, things that we're done using still, they stick around and we could find ways to reuse them. So yeah, I think circular economy is a, is a really important topic, uh, a, a place where there's going to be a lot of chemistry innovation to make it, make things possible, make change possible. And that's going to have to be coupled with policy too. Dr. Krishman, uh, you have published many uh, papers. So, what is the emphasis of your most recent publication? Well, I've, I've gone pretty dark on the publication circuit now for the last four years or so. Um, but I did have a really exciting paper published in 2018 that was some of the work that I did uh, with an exciting collaboration uh, when I was in Germany during my postdoc. Uh, and that work actually took six years from the time we started doing it to the time we, we first published. Uh, and it was focusing on a single nanoparticle as a light harvesting antenna that then had a platinum nanoparticle on the tip and some water oxidation catalysts on the sides so that it's a single entity that can harvest light and then split water into oxygen and hydrogen. And uh, we were able to demonstrate that in fact, you could have a single cadmium sulfide nanorod evolve hydrogen and oxygen simultaneously uh, under irradiation. And you know, after six years of hard work and excellent collaborators, uh, we, we actually published that in Nature Energy. And uh, it, was, it was a really fun, uh, collaboration. I also got to go to Munich to to work with some collaborators at LMU, uh, and our work there it was just fun being able to travel a little bit within Germany <laughs> to find the best collaborators. <laughs> hey, buddy. Uh, and uh, working in artificial photosynthesis was the last bit of work that I was doing uh, when I was in Germany. So. Now it's all batteries all the time. Doctor, as a scientist, do you see that percentage of women pursuing science careers is enough to make uh, a difference in the world? Uh, would you like to add something up to encourage young women to pursue sciences? Uh, I mean, I would certainly, I, I don't know the most recent statistics, uh, but I assume that there's still a disproportionate number of men graduating with science degrees. And I would like to see that leveled. Um, you know, things are trending in the right way, but we can't let off the gas in encouraging gender diversity and gender equity in sciences and science education. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a strong advocate for promoting inclusivity and, and equitable access to education, regardless of, of, of sex and, and sexual orientation. And so I would say we have work to do still.
is the is the short answer. Um, I think part of it is just focusing on cultural uh, norms and actually how we how we encourage young children. Uh, I think there's still kind of just like a, a psyche that men do math and science and, and women do social studies and psychology. And, and even if you don't believe that, uh, I think often uh, subconscious uh, can come forward and can encourage the, the gender bias to persist. So I think it's on all of us and in particular, you know, leaders in education to in, educate ourselves on the problem and use and bring that lens forward to interrupt our thinking whenever we do have, a, you know, an unconscious bias reaction and acknowledging that and also acknowledging that we're all going to make mistakes. Uh, but if you know, we're all trying and striving to, you know, make a more equitable future for the genders in science, and then uh, we can work together and and we can overcome our mistakes. And uh, I think we're on the right track, but let's let's keep pushing. Before we I'm, like... excited that, I'm excited that uh, the three of you, that all three of you are women pursuing a career in science. So, you, you know, keep it up. You're gonna be successful. You're gonna, you're gonna, I wish I had time to talk to each of you why you're interested in chemistry. <laughs> Before we wind up this conversation, Dr. Peter, is there anything else that you would like to add? Hmm. I didn't prepare any closing remarks. Uh, I will say that I encourage all of you in your class, Naranga, to reach out to me and because of science, and dedicated scientists. We're all going to be able to travel safely around the world again soon as we issue COVID-19 vaccines. Trust the science behind the vaccine, get your vaccine. And uh, please reach out to me if you're ever in California in the Bay Area and we'd be happy to give you a tour of our lab and take you out to lunch and, and chat more about your career. And uh, we'll see where, what Sepion is up to at that point. And thank you very much, Dr. Frischman, for sharing some insightful ideas with us. So this brings the end of our interview. Today we interviewed Dr. Peter Frischman, who is the CEO and the co-founder of Sapien Technologies. Thank you very much, Dr. for allocating your valuable time. Uh, have a great day. My pleasure. You too. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr.